The case I'd like to present is a 72 year old man um, who has a, a complex medical history, as many of these patients with critical limb ischemia do, including coronary artery disease with a prior percutaneous coronary intervention to his LED and RCA. He had a long standing history of diabetes, uh, prior history actually of an LV apical thrombus, uh, and was being treated with warfarin for that. He actually did not have a prior history of claudication. Uh, the patient was moderately ambulatory and active, uh, but he presented with a non healing wound of his left heel that had persisted for about two months. His left ABI uh, on initial testing was 0 0.42 with a toe pressure of 43 millimeters of mercury. So I think clearly this is somebody who had a non healing wound uh, despite uh, medical care. The fact that he didn't have baseline claudication raises the question of whether he had any disease in the femoropopliteal segment, or as we see in many of these cases, uh, isolated tibial disease uh, that then had subsequently resulted in uh, incomplete wound healing. And so consistent with that, the baseline angiography showed no inflow disease. Um, the patient did, however, have a long segment posterior tibial occlusion. Uh, he had distal reconstitution via, via perineal collaterals. I think you can appreciate here on these still frames that we've got a, a, a distal uh, popliteal there's a uh, perineal artery uh, that comes down uh, that appears to be the main runoff uh, to the foot. There is an occlusion of the posterior tibial near its origin, although it's not uh, exactly clear where the origin of that posterior tibial is uh, based on what appears to be the initial cap morphology. And then uh, there are posterior communicating branches of the perineal artery that reconstituted the posterior tibial a little bit above the level of the malleolus. Uh, there also was no apparent uh, reconstitution of the dorsalis pedis or the anterior tibial itself. So this was clearly a case where the patient had essentially uh, a one vessel runoff uh, through the perineal artery uh, that was cross collateralizing the posterior circulation with very minimal anterior circulation. Aaron, this is a pretty, pretty typical uh, case uh, or, or pattern, I should say, whereas um, when you get tibial disease of the AT and PT, the perineal becomes the, the lifeline, so to speak, and reconstitutes one of the two of those. Do you, do you have much of a, uh, any comments to make on an angiosomal based approach or do you, do you go for uh, that nice healthy looking PT or do you consider uh, putting a wire down in the DP to try to fish around for a hibernating vessel down there? What's, what's your thought process when you're approaching something like this? based on the wound and also your anatomy you have? Yeah, I mean, I think these are great questions because, you know, we technically have fairly reasonable collateralization from the perineal to the posterior tibial, but, but clearly the patient has not been able to heal its wound. And it appears that there's going to be a need for some kind of direct inline flow to the heel. Um, you know, one approach would be to try to recanalize the anterior tibial and come around the uh, pedal arch. I think given the fact that there appears to be a long segment AT occlusion and probably some significant hibernation of the dorsalis pedis. Um, the, I think the most expeditious approach here would be to find a way to more directly recanalize the posterior tibial. And whether that's an anagrade or a mixed anagrade retrograde approach, I think would be my primary uh, approach with this type of uh, lesion morphology and the fact that the wound was in the heel. Yeah, <clears throat> and looking at that posterior tibial, Dr. Mana, you would agree this is this could be a difficult one to Recanalize from an anti-grade approach uh, because I, I I personally don't see much of a stump of the PT there. You might be able to probe at it and find one, but but I would say this would be um, you know this is one where I think an anti-grade approach would be difficult um, potentially. You have any thoughts on how to find that that PT origin? This definitely looks uh, very difficult to find it. Well, I would do uh, an angio in, in three uh, projections probably, uh, but uh, if it remains hard uh, to find. Indeed, uh, a retrograde approach would be the first step uh, uh, to follow. Yeah, I, I think that within the absence of a stump, you got to think about that uh, a little bit in terms of um, you know what, how likely it is that you're going to need retrograde uh, access. And um, Aaron, what other what other factors uh, that perhaps we'll discuss here? What other factors are there that indicate whether or not we need to go anterograde or retrograde? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the points with regards to taking angiograms and multiple views uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, that is very important, I think, in, in really kind of visualizing the three dimensional structure that we're seeing in two dimensions at any given time. You know, there have been some attempts at describing uh, how to predict anagrade uh, tibial crossing. Uh, one of those was published by uh, Fadi Saab and uh, Jihad Mustafa and colleagues. And, you know, they do a lot of extravascular ultrasound as well as intravascular ultrasound. And they described this concept of the C-top classification that was based on a combination of angiography and duplex. Uh, 
And what they really were looking at here was the cap morphology. Uh, you know, whether you have a concave or a convex cap in the anagrade and retrograde uh, directions. And, and I think intuitively here, the concept was that, you know, if you have a concave cap uh, proximally, you're more likely to uh, be able to get into the center of the uh, occluded vessel. And then if it's convex distally, you're more likely to pop back into the center as well. So this C-top classification one may be easier to cross. In contrast, if you have a C-top four where it's a convex cap uh, proximally, uh, but retrograde, but from the retrograde direction is concave, it may be a type of lesion where you'd wanna approach from a, a retrograde first approach. So I think this isn't a hard and fast rule, but I think it is a concept that we probably have all internalized when looking at uh, caps and the morphology of some of these lesions. Um, my colleagues and I uh, tried to look at this in a systematic way as well and developed the infrapopoteal CTO score that was published recently. And uh, what this involved was taking both that cap uh, morphology, including whether it's blunt or has some kind of a tapering tip, uh, some measurement of the score and extent of the calcification, as well as the length of the occlusion and whether the occlusion was restenotic. And we found that these were these four characteristics were each independent predictors of successful anagrade crossing. And when we looked at 213 infrapopoteal CTOs that we treated, we overall had a 69% successful antigrade crossing rate, not taking into consideration retrograde crossing. And this scoring system was actually helpful with regards to predicting the likelihood of successful antigrade crossing. You can see if the score was zero or one, uh, basically we were always able to cross these lesions antigrade. But if the score was five or six, the chance of failing from an antigrade only approach uh, was 80 to 100%. So, you know, I think this can be a useful guide when approaching uh, any type of CTO. I think generally, I still always try antigrade, but when a lesion has some of these features, it lowers my threshold uh, for switching to a retrograde strategy. That's and a, I think it's a very nice algorithm and very simple. So I really, I really love that uh, that approach to to scoring these. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think it's great to have this scoring. Maybe for the upcoming years, it would be great to add a little bit of scoring regarding the retrograde puncture side, because sometimes, yeah, you don't find the origin and integrate. But this retrograde puncture site also a disaster and is not always open for uh, yeah, an easy puncture, let's say. So the combination of two might definitely become a very powerful tool in, in selecting uh, how to approach a uh, case. Yeah, those are those are really great points. And I think that, uh, you know, hopefully by perhaps using this algorithm, we can uh, look at future predictors of crossing and, and when to switch to a retrograde strategy. And, and also importantly, the characteristics of the retrograde vessel. Because um, I think, for example, in this case, there is a recanalized posterior tibial near the malleolus, whereas the Dr. Mane, in your case, there was not a clear retrograde puncture site, uh, which definitely increased the complexity of the case as well. So um, these are um, orthogonal views, just again, emphasizing the fact that there's not a clear cap of the posterior tibial um, to, to probe. And so this was would be a crossing score of five based on the system uh, that I just discussed, suggesting that this is not going to be an A approach. And so consistent with that, I tried uh, from an integrated approach perspective, and I used a, a wire escalation strategy, uh, starting with a softer tipped 014 Fielder XT wire, and then uh, escalated to a uh, Pilot 200, and then a Confiance Pro 12. But in each of these cases, I was able to engage what I thought may be the cap from an integrate approach. But uh, what I found was that it um, was not able to gain much traction, um, consistent with either I was not in the cap itself or the cap was very tough and difficult. And without a clear target, I think it was, it was difficult to proceed from an integrate approach. And so actually, Brian and uh, Dr. Monek, uh, what are your thoughts on this? How long do you try from an integrated approach in this type of lesion before you would consider switching retrograde? Well, let's say I mainly look, look at the behavior of my wire. If I see that um, when I'm still intraluminal, it's always deflecting in a, in a way that is definitely not consisting with the natural path of the posterior tibial artery, or when I'm in a subintimal plane and I see that the, the loop suddenly be, grows bigger and bigger, 
then I, I my threshold to stop is very low. I think uh, you can only make it worse and getting back in will be very difficult. And maybe you will even jeopardize um, yeah, your re-entry when you're coming from below. So threshold to go for a retrograde approach from distal nowadays for me is very low. Yeah, I, I think that summarizes uh, the approach well. <clears throat> I'll also say that the size of the distal vessel matters a little bit. If the distal vessel is uh, very small relative to the dissection plane that I'm creating from above, uh, then I'd be um, more worried about losing that uh, losing that target vessel by continuing to persist from above. But but by and large, these days, I mean the the, the biggest hurdle to get over when using retrograde access is is the decision to do it. You know, and and so setting yourself up to uh, to as setting yourself up with retrograde access as part of your plan really helps you jump to that more quickly. And I've, I've really never found that to be a mistake. So, you know, any case where I think I'm going to need potential retrograde access, I try to prep the leg or the foot appropriately so that it's just not a big chore to dump, jump to that approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great points with regards to the efficient efficiency of doing the procedure itself. And, and I too generally uh, make sure the the foot and the distal leg are are prepped in any of these cases. And you know, in in this case, I tried for about five minutes from an anti-grade approach before making the decision to switch to retrograde. And and generally, I found that uh, you know, if you're not getting a lot of traction early on, that that's my threshold for switching. You know, as Dr. Mane said, um, if you're getting some traction and making part way down the vessel, you can spend longer. But I think that you know, having that switch strategy embedded in your algorithm. I think really can make the difference for for keeping these cases short and and increasing your success rate too before fatigue sets in. So in this case, I did obtain retrograde uh, PT access. Um, I think one aspect of the uh, band eighteen wires that's nice too. I actually use that as my primary wire when obtaining retrograde uh, access. I, I think it's a it's a nice adjunct or alternative to using a micropuncture wire uh, because the band eighteen is a little more supportive and you can get more of the wire. Uh, further up uh, within the retrograde approach uh, prior to advancing either support catheter or a small caliber sheath uh, from the uh, retrograde access. In this case, I just used the back O and 8 support catheter for the PT approach. And then I actually used the same uh, wire combination installation from retrograde, starting with a Fielder XT, a Pilot 200, and the Confiance Pro 12. And this image that you've uh, seen moving here on the right actually shows, you know, having an anti-grade wire in place. And then this is the Confiance Pro 12 coming up retrograde. And you can see it tracked along the overall um, uh, characteristics of the vessel, but was clearly sub uh, And in this case, you know, we don't want to compromise the flow in the perineal artery either. Uh, so I did not want to re-enter farther up within the uh, within the Popple two artery itself. You know that in that last uh, slide you mentioned, you showed the uh, Fielder XT, the um, Confiance of twelve. Uh, you know a whole bunch of wires, and we've been talking about all these wires this this whole time. Um, and, it, and I think it's worth worth uh, discussing the concept of a workhorse versus a specialty wire. Um, because, uh, we've kind of gone back and forth between these wires without defining them, but. Dr. Mani, perhaps can you can you tell me what you think of as a workhorse wire? Uh, what what are some of the wires you use, and why do you use them as workhorse wires? Well, and uh, well, as a general rule for me, I try to limit the number of workhorse wires uh, uh, in every group. Uh, let's say the O35 mainly for the Aljax, then the O35 and O18 for the SFA, and below the knee, I mainly stick workhorse wire in class number one with the 014. Uh, for me, uh, as it's stated on the slide, it needs to be a wire that you know very well, that you're completely familiar with, and in all its specifications. So you need to know what it's uh, yeah, made of, you need to know what its um, components are. And for me, the command, um, the high torque command ES014 meets all these criteria, uh, because it gives me, it's like an extension of my hand. It's very good in feeling the plaque, and I don't like to have a, a too um, strong and aggressive wire to start, because sometimes you have these very long occlusions, and with some drilling, you're passing with no problem. And in these cases, I'm very happy that I have an atraumatic soft wire. When I'm passing in a lesion that I can't cross, well, then 
the threshold to go to go for a specialty wire shouldn't be too high. And then, um, well, sometimes I go for a 1.8, but mostly I stick with a 0.14 because I believe if you stay in low profile wire, you can use the very low profile balloons. And for me, that's a bigger advantage than the support of the wire itself. So I stay with the 1.4 uh, platform. In that case, I use uh, wind wires or I use the uh, Boston uh, Victory wires. Yeah, makes sense. How about you, Aaron? What what uh, talking about specialty wires? What are some specialty wires you use regularly, and why do you use them? Yeah, well, I think that uh, anytime I'm looking at a more complex lesion, it's a chronic occlusion. That's when I start thinking about the use of a, a specialty wire. And I, I think you know we've talked about a lot of these wires uh, today. You know, including examples of just giving of the Fielder XT, the Pilot 200, the Compounds Approach 12. Those are coronary wires. Uh, by design, they have a lot of specialty characteristics, including their tapered tips and the higher um, tip loads. I'll also sometimes use a uh, Terumo 018M wire uh, because of its ability to loop. Uh, I think something that's unique about the command 014 and 018 wires is that it walks the line between a workhorse and a special specialty wire because it has some really optimized workhorse characteristics. But as Dr. Mane pointed out as well, uh, it has the ability to form a nice tight loop and then it retains that shape um, after looping in a subminimal space. But I think it's, it does occupy a unique space uh, in the interplay between being a workhorse wire and having some special characteristics as well, uh, such that I think it can be a for some of these more complex lesions. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And I love this slide because it really uh, highlights this concept of a workhorse versus a specialty. A, a workhorse wire, I think of as one that I'm going to use at my initial access, getting my sheath up and over, my initial diagnostics, maybe even crossing an occlusion in the SFA. So that's where, for example, a stiff glide would be a, an example of my workhorse wire. It's what I use in almost every single case to begin and, and put do probably 90% of the case if it's if it's above the knee. And then you get to the specialty wire. Specialty wires are wires you're going to use maybe in 10% of the case or 5% of the case. It's a wire where uh, you're at you're at a, a stopping point or a decision point, you know, and you need you need to accomplish one specific task. So, for example, you've got a CTO and you need to pop through that cap, or you have a very tight stenosis or a very tortuous anatomy where you need something like the Fielder XT with its tapered tip and very floppy tip that's going to sort of navigate through something that nothing else will navigate through. And so. My, my specialty wires I use a very limited percent of the time, generally at a com complex portion of the case or a critical junction point of the case. And they're, they're wires that are pulled out for a very specific purpose and then they're put away. Whereas my workhorse wire is going to be something I'll use all the way through. And, and I will say that the command wires, as you highlighted, are, are literally, uh, they're workhorse wires in an 018 and 014 platform. And I never thought that I would consider an 014 or 018 wire to be a workhorse wire. But the truth is, those the properties of those two wires are so different than every other wire in terms of their, their durability, their support, their navigability, all of those things you, you think of in a workhorse wire they have. And so that's why I think those two wires are sort of exceptional in their workhorse properties uh, in a smaller platform. Yeah, I think that's a really great points. And I, yeah, that's a great thing about it too, the specialty wire occupies a critical junction in the case we're using it for that specific purpose. You're not gonna leave that wire in to complete the rest of the work. So it makes a difference to success failure. And uh, yeah. tip load measurements uh, is is a key component of that. Do you want to talk about tip load, Brian? Uh, sure. I mean, I don't think I could go through it in too much detail, but both tip load measurement um, and uh, and and uh, penetration power are two things that I think are are important characteristics of specialty wires. So specifically, our our wires we use for occlusions. Tip load refers to how much um, force is required to deflect the tip of the wire, the first one centimeter of the wire, at two millimeters. And then when you move to penetration power on the next slide, uh, penetration power essentially um, uh, d discusses or, or, or refers to the ability of that wire tip to engage into and through a lesion. And that's a, that's a product of both the tip load as well as the diameter of the wire. So the, the higher the tip load, meaning the, the harder it is to deflect that tip, 
and the smaller diameter of the wire, the, the, that makes the, those two factors um, increase the penetration power and allow us to engage through a tip. So, so these, these are the sort of qualities that make up some of our wires we use for occlusions somewhat like very rigid spears with tapered tips that really pop into that lesion or that cap and engage that cap and let us sort of get access to the, to the lesion. Um, and so these are examples of, you know, when you look at the, the extreme of penetration power or tip load, that, that almost by definition puts a wire into the, the specialty wire class. So these, these are things that are, are um, you know, very different than our workhorse wires, which are going to be on the low end of these, these sort of factors of penetration power and tip load. Yeah, and I think these are very helpful slides that they do emphasize that when you're using a specialty wire and trying to maximize the tip load and penetration power, you do have to have a support catheter relatively close to the tip of that wire or else it's going to lose the characteristics that make that wire special. Um, and so I think there's a, there's always an interplay between how far down you put a support catheter or a balloon when you're in a sub minimal space and you know maximizing that penetration power. The fact that the diameter of the wire squared uh, determines the penetration power, I think also speaks to why 0 and 8 wires have uh, such more penetration power than an 0 and 4 wire in many cases. Uh, there can be a fairly dramatic difference despite the, the small difference in the diameter. So, you know, what did I do in this case? Uh, you know, clearly I had tried antegrade, retrograde, I was sub um with the wires that I had used. So the wire that I ended up using here uh, was actually a Gladius wire. This is an Asahi uh, specialty wire that uh, is polymer jacketed and 018. Um, the, uh, what happened here was it was able to advance in the subminimal space and formed a, a tight loop that you can then see uh, worked its way around the anti-grade wire. And I think it was helpful here to have an anti-grade wire in place in order to really uh, show where the true lumen was so that I felt comfortable pushing that wire. And, uh, you know, the wire was able to re-enter into the true lumen, and I was then able to externalize the wire. And so um, after balloon angioplasty, uh, you can see that this did re-canalize the origin of the posterior tibial. I think an interesting point here is that, you know, from an integrated approach, I would have assumed that the posterior tibial origin was higher up, probably near where this collateral comes off, but actually it had a much lower origin uh, near this kind of hood type appearance. Uh, just distal to the perineal. So I think, again, it emphasizes how this cap was very difficult uh, to determine from any kind of integrate approach and why retrograde was, I think, uh, what made this case successful. Unfortunately, after all this balloon angioplasty initially, and probably because of the sub spaces that I was in, uh, there was also a fairly extensive dissection. You can see there's a spiraling nature uh, around this dissection cap, probably making it a, a D or even E dissection. And there's a question of whether it may be influencing flow into the perineal itself as well. So um, in this particular case, uh, after ballooning this dissection, there was still continued recoil and dissection. So I actually put in three tacks uh, below the knee. These are now approved for uh, infrapopliteal use and I think are a nice adjunct uh, if you have continued dissection uh, after extensive balloon angioplasty. And then I perform balloon angioplasty in that tack, and then uh, kissing balloon angioplasty across the origin of the perineal and the posterior tibial in order to ensure that there was adequate outflow through each vessel. And this is just that final kissing balloon angioplasty with some low profile 0 and 4 balloons. And this is what that final result looked like. You can see that there is some residual dissection uh, within the uh, popliteal. Uh, there was no gradient here, uh, so I did not uh, uh, perform any other uh, implant here. Uh, but there was excellent final runoff uh, from the perineal and the posterior. Thinking risk flow down into the posterior tibial and reconstitution of the medial and lateral plantar vessels as well. So, um, any comments on the rest of that case uh, and approach? Would you guys have? Do you think it was reasonable to do some kind of bailout uh, treatment of that dissection? Well, very nice case, absolutely. Uh, I had two questions uh, coming up coming up in my mind. First, uh, to uh, have a, an, an easy access, did you put any micro sheet, or were you just going in with a catheter or a balloon? Uh, and uh, secondly, did you ever consider to make a full reconstruction of this uh, bifurcation with the bifurcated stenting? Or do you say, no, uh, the posterior for me is the mainly and uh, most important vessel, so let's go for that one? 
Yeah, no, those those are great questions, and I think they speak to the uh, the technical aspects of all of this. I think that uh, in this case, I did use just an 018 support catheter bareback, so I did not put in a sheath. Uh, my rationale for that was that I was using the wire uh, for crossing and then externalize the wire to complete the case. Um, more routinely, though, I usually these days put in a low profile sheath, whether it's a micropuncture sheath or, or four French glide sheath. And then sometimes that does give more options with regards to uh, balloon angioplasty uh, in the area. And then, you know, dealing with this bifurcation, I think, is a, is a complicated issue. I think an alternative strategy would be to do some kind of a two stent approach uh, here or to do, um, you know, more extensive uh, stent implantation across the uh, origin of the perineal and into the popliteal artery. But I felt here that with the kissing balloon angioplasty and the tacks within the pop within the posterior tibial artery, that I had at least reconciled the dissection planes um, such that the um, patency of the perineal was likely to not be impacted. And actually, the perineal and the posterior tibial have remained patent over time. So in this case, at least that appears to have worked. But I think this is an area where we need more data and really understand, um, you know, what types of scaffolds or uh, implants could be. Um, the most efficacious in these lesions below the knee. Yeah, we've we've accepted dissections and tibials for a long time because we just don't have anything else. Um, the the tack is a nice uh, option to have. It, I still worry with with the tack. It's just another implant that is in permanent and could have long term ramifications. And of course, the Life BTK study, which has just started up, is is exploring the use of of um, scaffolds, bioresorbable scaffolds, and I, that I think are probably going to be a great um, a great advantage or for for dealing with these type of things, or a great tool in the armamentarium. So we're we're all of course looking forward to enrollment and completion of that trial to to see how those will work out. But I think you did a great nice job, and this is a great case highlights a lot of things that we've talked about in terms of wire selection. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, just uh, to think about algorithms again, I think we all have our own algorithm. Um, and I think this is something that needs to continue to be systematized. But, you know, I think broadly, of course, I think about, you know, am I treating a stenosis or an occlusion? We have very different goals in those cases. If it's, if it's a stenosis, the goal, of course, is wire control and avoiding dissection. And I think some good options here include using uh, any of the command uh, wires. I also will use the 014 run through in some of these cases. Uh, occlusions, uh, of course, the goal here is, are we going to stay true lumen or subminimal? I think if it's feasible, true lumen is generally always a preferred strategy. Uh, one algorithm I use that I showed here includes the use of some coronary wires, including the Fielder XT, Pilot 200, and Confianza Pro 12 with a wire escalation approach. And then some ON8 wires with wire escalation with the Treasure 12, Gladius, Halberd, and Estado 30. And then from a subminimal approach, I think we've discussed uh, the value of the uh, command wires uh, in these cases because of the nice tight loop that they can form and some of the cutting that they'll do in the subminimal plane. Uh, the V18 is an option, although I think that the command 18 does a better job of maintaining its tip shape over time. And then the Trumo M wire uh, does also make a nice uh, tight loop as well and can be useful sometimes in subminimal uh, planes. So this is just a, a group of wires that I tend to use on a regular basis. I think we each have our own algorithms. I think it speaks to the complexity of a lot of these lesions and trying to obtain both the initial crossing, but the best possible subsequent angioplasty result as well. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <clears throat> we can go over this <clears throat> this slide. I, I think that <clears throat> I think that we approach these probably in a very similar way. <clears throat> Um, I, I also look at the lesion itself as a stenosis versus occlusion. Uh, if it's a stenosis, really, the, the main the main thing I'm going to try to prevent is making that stenosis turn into a full occlusion. So if you've got a lumen, you you need to take make use of it, and and that's where I think using something like the 018. Uh, command, <clears throat> which is very navigable, very steerable, and hydrophilic uh, tip, either the 014 or 018. Um, in the 035 platform, the glide wire is probably the, the lesion of choice, but really it, for a tight stenosis, you want something that will uh, be a low profile wire to get through those areas and prevent turning an easy case into a hard case. Because once you, if you cause a dissection that leads to an occlusion of a, of a high grade stenosis, then you're, then you're doing a, a, a CTO type case, which is very different. For occlusions, I look at really the morphology, and if it's a long lesion, um, a fully occluded long lesion, either soft or, or calcified, that's that's one type of lesion. On the other hand, occlusions that are made up of a, a series of skip occlusions, 
um, where there's some some uh, hibernating patent portions of the vessel, that's that's another very different lesion. And so for those long fully occluded lesions where you have maybe 200 millimeters of an occlusion, those I'm going to generally go into a subintimal approach in most cases, uh, certainly in SFA, but but to a lesser degree maybe in the tibials. But but oftentimes those those long full occlusions are going to require a subintimal approach and or a retrograde approach. And and shown here are some of my wires for subintimal approach. Whereas if I have a, a focal occlusion or a series of skip occlusions uh, with patent vessel in between those, those are places that I really want to use some of these specialty wires like the Connect 250T to try to drill through that focal occlusion, get back into lumen, and then, and then carry on. So I guess we'll, we'll sort of wrap up just by, by um, saying that this is you know, we talked about, uh, again, this is a slide we saw, saw at the beginning of the uh, presentation. And again, it sort of highlights the idea that we, uh, we, we need to understand our wires and the, and the building blocks that give the, give the, um, that lead to the technical properties of the wire. And those technical properties lead to the, the uh, clinical or functional properties that we've come to recognize as, as being the reasons why we choose a specific wire for a specific purpose. And then when we are um, choosing our wires, it largely depends on what we're what we're doing, what the lesion looks like, whether we're coming retrograde, how much how much flexibility does a wire require to navigate around an arch. And we saw great examples of all of this uh, in these two cases by Dr. Mane and Dr. Armstrong. So I think that the, the more you learn about your wires and your building blocks for the wires and what properties those will um, uh, um, bestow upon your wire, the more you can match it up to some of these these lesions and, and get the kind of results that we saw from these great operators today. Any, any final comments by either of you? Well, thanks very much. I think the fantastic case is really great in-depth discussion. Um, I found it very useful. I learned a lot and uh, I hope that uh, anyone uh, watching this uh, feels the same. I think that it does emphasize how wires are really the building blocks of what we do for these complex cases. And if, if you don't have the right wires or you don't have the techniques to use them, you can't cross the lesion and you're not gonna be successful. So I think, um, I think the nuts and bolts of this really add to the overall success of these complex procedures. I uh, absolutely agree. And I believe that uh, the knowledge of this uh, components of the wires that was uh, really uh, revealing the last years uh, uh, is, is very important in your daily practice. And I believe if we work through this, uh, the coming years, then the cases will become uh, a lot easier to understand and so the wire selection will definitely help us uh, a lot in gaining uh, access to the most critical and most complex uh, uh, cases. Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Mane, Dr. Durobertis, thank you very much for your input. Thank you for the session. It was very, very illustrative in terms of what we want to understand and what we want to learn of, you know, the different approaches that we can see in different cases with different wires, with different tools, which usually is a question that we're asked. And I think this gives guidance in terms of what we want to communicate, uh, you know, from your perspective uh, as how each one of these cases are approached. Thank you very much. I'd like to close the session uh, once more. Um, thank you very much for this time. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. a lot. Yeah.